Yeah, well, thank you so much for uh, setting all this up. This is uh, much beyond. I just said, I'd like to meet some locals. And here we are, <laughs> I'm very much uh, everything I could want. So, um, so I hope to try to have a non-technical aspect to this, to try to explain just the very simple essence of what I want to do, and then give some maybe of the technical uh, aspects of the story. This is joint work with Kai Berend and, um, and so I want to begin with a well-known uh, statement that um, if so if A is a finite dimensional associative algebra um, then I can take inside A all of the invertible elements. So that's an open subset. And it's a Lie group. So this is one source for Lie groups. Um, so I want to generalize this. I want to ask the following question. Um, so what if A is a graded differential algebra? So I had better explain uh, what that is. The um, example you can bear in mind, I, I should start maybe with an example. If I take matrices of differential forms on a manifold, then it's graded because we have the degree of the differential form. And it has a product, which is just multiplication of matrices of differential forms. And it has a differential, which is the Durham differential. So that's, that's the, uh, I need a question mark here. So um, for example, matrices of differential forms. So, so let me, um, let, I should just start by saying, that the correct generalization of this to the more general setting is not going to be to take invertible elements. So I'll just warn you. And so my task is going to be to explain a, I think, quite elegant way of understanding the generalization of this that works in a much more general situation. So that's, that's my goal. So let me uh, just define what a differential graded algebra is. So, uh, differential graded algebra. So, A will be a sum over uh, subspaces AK, and we say that AK ha elements of AK have degree K. And uh, so A is an algebra. Oh, um, I can't. I, yeah, I mean, for me, it's going to be the complex numbers, but I. It could be over any ring, I suspect. I suspect that actually what I'm going to do today, I, I, forget, I forgot to check. I don't think I use anything in particular, but we'll see. 
Uh, I can double check afterwards if you if, if I, I think that might be safer. So A is an algebra, and we assume that the product of elements in of degree K with elements of degree L have degree K plus L. And when I say algebra, I'll assume there's an identity element, and this identity element had better be degree zero. So then, um, in addition, I have a differential. And so the differential goes from AK to AK plus one, and we assume it satisfies two equations. D squared is zero, and D of AB equals DA times B plus minus one to the KA times DB. So that's what a differential graded algebra is. Uh, for now, I'll just assume that my differential graded algebra is finite dimensional. So that's not exactly the example that I gave, which was differential forms, but I'll come back to that uh, at, towards the end of the talk. Basically, I'll replace finite dimensional vector spaces by Banach spaces later in the talk, so I'll bring in a bit of analysis. So, So the, the point is that when you have a differential around, that it's somehow wrong to demand equality. That you should always demand equality up to the differential of something. This is the sort of, I don't know, the basic idea of cohomology. And what I'm roughly going to be talking about today is a non-abelian analog of cohomology. So, so uh, we only demand invertibility up to a differential. So, um, so now let me assume that I have an element A. So I'm only going to uh, talk about the, uh, so I'm going to introduce a new concept, well, maybe not new for you, uh, and not, I mean, sorry. So this is a concept which we work with called quasi-invertibility, and it'll be a property of elements of degree zero, okay? So A is quasi-invertible, If, so first of all, we should have a quasi-inverse. So, so the quasi-inverse I'll call B, uh, also degree zero, such that, so there are going to be three axioms. So you may say that's too many, but we'll see. So, so the first axiom is um, there is an H in degree minus one, such that DH equals uh, one minus AB. So, although A times B isn't necessarily equal to 1, it's at least a co-boundary. So it's D of something. And we think of D of something as being less important. Um, also, so this is for left multiplication, but we also have right multiplication, and I have to also assume that there's an element of degree minus 1, which I'll call K, such that uh, dk is 1 minus ba. So these are actually, of course, if the algebra is commutative, uh, graded commutative, then uh, we could take h equals k. If it's finite dimensional, it should be also true. Is that right? I don't know. I think so. I didn't think of that. 
have to, what, that if one is, can be solved, then the other is automatic? That's kind of interesting. Okay. <laughs> Never thought of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there should be a relationship between H and K. Uh, there is a P of degree minus 2 such that if I take um, H, what have I got here? H A minus A K, that's equal to DP. Uh, no, sorry, K A minus A H. Have I, uh, one or the other, sorry, uh, okay. Um, so this looks a bit complicated, but it turns out uh, that this is sort of the right definition of quasi-invertible. And it can be motivated. One way to say it is that um, I have two elements of degree zero, two elements of degree negative one, and I could actually keep going. I could have two elements of degree negative two, two elements of degree negative three, and so on, but it turns out that I've actually thrown away all but three pieces of the data because that's enough. Now, if we are just back in an algebra, so everything in degree zero, then we can just take h, well, h, k, and p will automatically be zero, and therefore a will be invertible. So this is the same thing as a um, as invertibility in that case, or more generally, if there's nothing in negative degree. Uh, but uh, this is um, the notion I want to work with. And oh, I see. Ah. <laughs> uh, no, no, I'll I'll continue writing and then I'll push it up. No, okay. Uh, what? No, no. Oh, this. Oh, that. I see. Okay, 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 okay. Try again. Uh. <laughs> good, good. Okay, I didn't. Yeah. Um, so here's a, a observation: the quasi-invertible element. So first of all, notice. Whoa. I forgot to mention a key point. Um, I need an uh, if uh, so such that. So I need dA equals dB equals zero. That's and. So, so quasi-invertibility will only be defined for co-cycles, for things which are closed. So, um, so let me give a, an analog of this statement. Um, lemma. The set of quasi-invertible elements of uh, A is an open subset of the zero co-cycles of A. So the elements of degree zero such that whose differential vanishes. So that's, I believe the statement is new um, in our work, but I might be a bit wrong. So this, to me, gives a little bit of a taste of how you need to have a notion which is essentially like this, this complicated in order to correctly generalize to differential graded algebra the original notion of invertibility. So that's the first little taste of our results. So. Um, since I'm talking about this, I want to mention a generalization 
to Banach algebras, because actually to prove this, I more or less at the same time prove it for Banach algebras. So, um, so in fact, these st statements are true if A is a differential graded Banach algebra. So differential graded Banach algebra uh, just mean that each of those spaces AK is a Banach space. And the differential, well, the product is, uh, the product is continuous. Um, from AK cross AL to AK plus L. And uh, the differential is bounded. Um, well, the risky to poly, I mean, that's the stronger statement in the finite dimensional case. So if I go to Banach spaces, then I only get open in the continuous topology, in the normal, what's the word for the topology. And so the Zariski statement is a stronger statement because, uh, yeah. So the original statement, I was, I, I wasn't, um, y you understood it as a risky, but maybe not everybody <laughs> understood it in the room as a risky. That's, um, and to generalize to Banach spaces, I, of course, I have to give up Zariski. Uh, I had to learn about why that was true. Somehow, uh, so Duadi, in fact, developed a whole theory uh, of um, uh, analytic geometry for Banach spaces. And basically, if you, you're replacing, in this context, we were working with um, uh, algebraic varieties and algebraic geometry, but over here we have to work with analytic geometry. Uh, the differential is bounded. Right. So it's, so for me, that's the original statement that if you have a Banach space, the invertible elements is open is somehow one of the most beautiful things in quantum mechanics that the property of being an invertible operator on a Banach space is in a uh, sorry on a Hilbert space is a is an open condition so that's proved by a geometric series argument and this this statement that in differential graded Banach algebra that something similar continues to hold is a more sophisticated version of that perturbation theory argument. And one of our main techniques was to set things up so that we could conduct that argument. So I, I wasn't planning to give the argument. It's a little bit complicated, uh, but, um, but it's not 100% complicated. I mean, you can understand it, uh, just there are a lot of details. Oh. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So you just, so I can give a hint why it's true, um, which is I can form a matrix um, from H, K, B, and P, and this matrix has very good properties. The differential of this matrix uh, satisfies some equation, and I can then insert that into the inverse function theorem or the implicit function theorem. Now, the implicit function theorem remains true for Banach spaces, so that's basically how things work. So, I want to put this observation in a bigger context now, and so I am going to start the talk again. Um,
and ask this time, uh, what is a groupoid? Okay. <laughs> Yes. Well, so the problem there is I don't have any negative degree elements, and so the notion of invertibility is just, maybe it's an invertible. Hmm? So it only, you only get something interesting if you use graded matrices. So if I have, so basically I get into the world of twisted complexes. So I'm very much in Kapranov land in these applications. That's, I mean, it was in some sense thinking about some, actually that's not accurate, but it turned out in retrospect that we had, uh, our work is a sequel to Kapranov's work. So anyway, um, so what is a groupoid? So maybe you know what a groupoid is. I'm sure you know what a category is. And so a groupoid is a category in which every morphism is invertible. All right? So that's one definition of a groupoid. But to do that, you first have to define what a category is. And it's slightly complicated to say what a category is. So I want to talk about a different approach, which was pioneered by, I think, Graham Siegel, uh, well, Milner before him, as to what a groupoid is in terms of the so-called nerve of the groupoid. So I'm going to introduce a collection of categories, so for each natural number. And this category, it's kind of the simplex the n simplex in the world of categories. So it's the category whose objects are the vertices of the n simplex, and there's a morphism from one vertex to another only if you're going uphill, so only if the number increases. Um, and then there's only one. So it, this is also known as a partially, uh, as a, well, it's actually a well-ordered set. Um, and, and all partially ordered sets are very simple examples of categories. So this category, um, so the objects are the vertices of the n simplex. And so the nerve of the groupoid is for each n we take the set of all functors from this category to the groupoid. So <coughs> let n sub n of g, g will be my groupoid, equal the set of all functors. Okay. And I want to show you how to reconstruct the groupoid from this nerve. So in fact, there's too much information here, but I'll, um, uh, that's, uh, that's okay. Uh, okay, so the point is that it's not, this isn't just a sequence of sets. There are natural maps between these sets that come from functors between these categories. So, if um, uh, if uh, phi from m to n is a functor, what is a functor from m to n? It's just a function from the vertices, from the objects here to the objects here, together with um, just the condition that it preserves uh, order. So it's all order-preserving functions. So if phi is a functor, then we get a 
induced map back again. Okay? So for example, if I apply this to a group, so if G is a group, so that's a groupoid with one object, then um, the nerve is just a product of n copies of G with itself. So you can you can check that. So, so I want to explain to you, so this resulting thing that we get is called a simplicial set. So n of g is an example of a simplicial set. And what I'm going to do is tell you uh, the characterization of these simplicial sets among all simplicial sets. So that will give a different way of saying what a groupoid is, which will be very convenient for this talk. So, um, so how to characterize nerves of groupoids. So when I first gave this talk, I said that this was, I had read somewhere, I think, <laughs> that this was an idea of Grotendieck, but I've never been able to find where Grotendieck said this, so I don't know anymore whether this is true. But I ascribed it to Grotendieck, this idea. So, um, so what I'm going to do is uh, go back to, so if you've done a course on simplicial sets, you'll have learned the concept of a Kahn uh, complex. So it's a, um, a simplicial set with some extra properties, which are really, the first time you meet them, quite hard to understand. And unfortunately, that's exactly what I need now. So, um, So Kahn's idea is the following. He introduces, so he introduces simplicial sets, which he denotes like this, and these are called the horns. So to define them, I need to um, observe that delta n is itself, so there is a simplicial set which is the n-simplex. So how is that? This is actual, so this is defined using the Yoneda uh, uh, lemma. So what we do is we, we um, so the the m-simplices of the n-simplex are just functors from delta M to delta N. So it's a lot like what we did for a groupoid, except we just do it for a category. So this is the nerve of the, uh, uh, sorry, I just, yeah. So it's the nerve of our original category bracket N. So that's, that's what the n simplex is. And the n simplex has n plus 1 faces, which are n minus 1 simplices. This is just like the combinatorics of the geometric n simplex. And this is obtained by removing the interior of the n simplex along with the i face. 
So it's the union j not equal to i of the jth face of delta n. So I, I could define what the jth face is, but just imagine that it's the face which doesn't contain the jth vertex. So if I take all the faces which uh, of this form, then I get all the faces which touch the ith vertex. So uh, it would be nice to give a picture. So for n equal to 2, here's the 2 simplex. So it has three vertices and three 1 simplices and a, a 2 simplex, I mean, in the middle. Uh, and so lambda 2, 0 looks like that picture. Lambda 2, 1 looks like this picture, okay? And you can do this in lower dimensions. You could do it with n equals 1. For n equals 1, you just get one end of the one simplex or the other. So, so now we come to Kahn's condition. Um, we can take... Um, some uh, maps of simplicial sets so in other words compatible with all of these operations phi pullback along any functor between these categories so it's some diagram of sets and we have maps of these diagrams of sets uh, maps of simplicial sets lambda n i to, um, to a simplicial set x, okay? And then there's a map from the n simplices of x, the set x n, to this, because this is, this is maps from the n simplex to x which is more or less the Yonida lemma. So another way of saying it is if I have an n simplex of x, I can take the collection of its faces, which are all but the ith face, and that gives me such a map like this. Now, the, a groupoid, so x is the nerve of a groupoid, If and only if. It is calm, yeah? I'm sorry? If, if, if it is calm, yes? No, no, that's not good enough. That, what we could call that infinity groupoid. If and only if this map is a bijection for um, n. Uh, greater than or equal to 2 and i between 0 and n. So that's, it's a, in fact, it suffices to take n equals 2 and n equals 3. So that is not your usual axioms for a groupoid, but that is axioms for a groupoid. In this way, if I take the, the category of things that satisfy this, I get a category equivalent to the category of groupoids. So the main point of my talk is this is, for purposes of geometry, a better definition of groupoid than perhaps the usual one, a category all of whose morphisms are invertible. Okay? 
Should I prove this? I, I don't think I, I probably don't have time. How am I doing? I'm going till like quarter past six, is that right? Okay. So, so, the so what I'm going to do in this talk is take this assertion and, and play with it. And so I want to modify it for purposes first of geometry and then of, um, uh, and then remove the condition that we have a groupoid and go in the di direction of Kahn complexes. So, um, so first of all, let's do some geometry. I want uh, something which is uh, closer to the ideas of Eresmann of Lie groupoids. And in fact, I'm going to be able to produce axioms for Lie groupoids by the same technique. So let me, so Erismann introduced in, I think, 1957, the idea of what he called a differentiable groupoid. And somehow, a decade later, they got renamed uh, to Lie groupoids. <coughs> and for those of you in algebraic geometry, these are very similar to smooth Artin stacks. So, in particular, uh, smooth Deline Mumford stacks or orbifolds fit into this language. And so it's a very natural context in which to do differential geometry. So, what was Erismann's idea? So, in retrospect, we can say that he put axioms on a groupoid enriched in manifolds. So, all of the operation. It, the, the space of objects should be a manifold, the space of morphisms should be a manifold, and all of the, the source and target and the inverse and the product should all be differentiable maps. And so he put an extra axiom on that context which allows one to form the nerve. In, in retrospect, that's what he was saying. So, in fact, you can say that a... Um, a Lie groupoid is, can be just written in this language. So I'll do that now. So the key idea is that the objects of the groupoid and the morphisms of the groupoid form um, um, manifolds. And then we have a pair of maps from the morphisms oops, to the objects, um, the source and the target. And then, of course, we also have composition. But the point is, you can only compose if the source of the first guy equals the target of the second. So something like this is a fibered product. Uh, maybe I should actually the TS should go up there. It's a fibered product over the space of objects. So this isn't just the product like it is in the theory of groups. It's, it's a fibered product. And then we get a map to morphisms. Notice this is just the two, the space or the set of two simplices in the nerve. And this is the set of one simplices. And it turns out that this map multiplication 
it's associated to a particular uh, so remember I said that if I had uh, a map from M to N then I got a map on the nerves back in the opposite direction and here so this map is mu pullback so mu is just it takes the vertices 0 and 1 to the vertices 0 and 2 so it skips the middle vertex and then it turns out that's what multiplication is in this language now you see the problem how do I say that this is differentiable unless this is a manifold and so um, well, so if I was in the world of algebraic varieties, uh, I could form the fibered product and then maybe I could get some distance. But, but it's somehow the wrong thing to do. And we should really require that this fibered product uh, exists for good reasons. And that should be that the map from morphisms to objects is a, um, a submersion, a smooth morphism in the world of algebraic geometry. So that was precisely Erisman's condition. So it, because it's a groupoid, uh, as soon as one of them is a submersion, the other one is automatically. But yes, we may as well assume that they're both. So, so that's the axiom. So Erisman's axiom. S and T are submersions. So, so now I can go back here and say a simplicial manifold X is the nerve of a Lie groupoid if and only if this map is a submersion I may as well put subjective submersion, although surjectivity is automatic for n equals 1. Is a subjective submersion for n equals 1, i equals 0 and 1, and a diffeomorphism for n greater than 1 and i between 0 and n. So that's that's how this language of nerves serves to explain very natural geometric concepts like a Lie groupoid in a very down-to-earth way. We just have to replace the notion of surjectivity, which occurs in Kahn's theory of Kahn complexes, by the notion of subjective submersion. So now I'm just going to say, uh, this is great. I'm now going to, I can define so this is a theorem, and now I'm going to make a definition in exactly the same style. So a simplicial manifold X is the nerve of a Lie K groupoid if and only if this map is a subjective submersion for N less than or equal to K and I going from 0 to N and a diffeomorphism for n greater than k, i going from so 0 to n. can do exactly the same for stacks? Or still you, well, so, the, so here's how uh, I'll just, so for those of you who know about stacks, so stacks are, so the objects in the category of stacks are somehow equivalence classes of these things. Uh, th these would be smooth k stacks. But we have to have far more morphisms, so the morphisms between stacks are a zigzag of morphisms in a certain sense. So it's the same, so these are the objects in the category of stacks, but I don't want to talk about stacks because I'd have to talk about what the morphisms were. But it's not hard in this language. Okay? Does that sort of answer your question? Uh, <laughs> um, yes, although I think a more basic question mm -hmm. Is why uh, we cannot uh, just take algebraic varieties, right? Oh, you can. 
Absolutely. But I still want to keep this subjective submersion. Okay? So that seems to be a very intrinsic part of the story. So in fact, in our paper, we exactly do what you're suggesting. Um, and we define the, the, a Lee K groupoid to be a simplicial analytic variety satisfying this condition. Because Duadi was able to define what submersion is for uh, Banach analytic varieties. So it, goes, it works fine. And as soon as the space of objects is a manifold, then all the higher ones are manifolds as well by this condition. So, so it's really just a question. So, uh, so at this point, I should give you a basic example of a Lie groupoid, in case you haven't seen them before. So they're just dynamical systems. We have a group acting on a space. So if it's a Lie group, acting differentiably on a manifold, we get a Lie groupoid. Um, so the action should be differentiable and then all of this data allows us to define a Lie groupoid. The, these are the objects. These are the morphisms. And this, this action is the target map, T. So that's how the data of a group action turns into the data of a Lie groupoid. And in that case, the nerve so x n is just g to the n cross n in, in this example. So that you can run all of these uh, statements with this case and see how it goes. A good exercise would be to try to give an example of a Lie 2 groupoid, which is not a Lie groupoid. Um, that's, so, so let's do that. So uh, in the final minutes of my talk, I'm going to show you a source of examples of these objects. So to do this, I... So to do this, I need to introduce the idea of the Morecarton locus. Of a differential graded algebra. And actually, it, it's really a functor on l differential graded Lie algebras but I'm just going to use it for algebras today. Okay. So the Morikatan equation, this is an equation um, on the space of degree one elements of the algebra. So it actually only depends on degree one and degree two elements. So it's quite it, it throws away the rest of the structure of the differential graded algebra. And the equation is uh, dx plus x squared equals zero. So if x has degree one, then dx has degree two, and x squared has degree two, and so we, we get. So this, going back to the question of uh, what characteristic we're in, uh, this is why I suspect that it works over the integers because there are no denominators in this formula for algebras. For Lie algebras, there is. So uh, it's a very different theory. So um, I'm going to call the uh, algebraic variety or in the Banach world, the analytic variety of solutions of this. Um, the, well, I should think of it really as a scheme. Um, so call that MCA. Okay, 
So this is in the case of um, a finite dimensional differential graded algebra, this is some uh, affine variety. And um, it's the reason we call it Morag Hatar is that if you think of X as the curvature of a connection, remember I began with matrices of differential forms, then uh, this is the condition for the connection to be flat. Now, uh, so if you want me to have positively graded and negatively graded elements, then I have to use matrices which are graded, so uh, acting on graded vector spaces instead of just ungraded vector spaces. Okay, so now do I have time to give my... I think I do. Okay, so now I just want to write the functor and state the theorem. So to do this, and this is quite closely related to a paper of Kapranov, he, um, well, he's answering a slightly different question, but he was interested in investigating um, the problem of, uh, so he wanted to study these nerves for uh, affine algebraic groups and showed that there was some sort of resolution of that in a similar way to the world of, um, so in a similar way to homological algebra. And so that his paper is one of the first and key papers in the theory of derived geometry. And everything I'm talking about here will actually uh, go over to that context of Kapranov. But let me do my functor. So, um, so I'm going to replace this category N by a fatter category, which is a groupoid. And it's an extremely boring groupoid um, because it has the same objects as N, but between each two objects here, there's a unique morphism. So every morphism in here is invertible. The morphism from I to J must have as its inverse the morphism from J to I. So um, same objects as uh, N and a unique uh, morphism, invertible morphism from I to J for all I and J. So, so this guy has many more morphisms than this one. And so if I take the nerve of this guy, I get a much bigger simplicial set. So the nerve of this simplicial set is the N simplex. And in particular, it's N dimensional. It's a finite dimensional simplicial complex. This guy, if I take its nerve, I do get a simplicial set with a finite number of simplices in each dimension, but it's infinite dimensional. So that's a disadvantage. But the N simplex sits inside that simplicial complex, and that's the simplicial complex I'm interested in. So, um, so taking nerves, we get uh, delta N sitting inside what I like to call uh, fat delta N. Uh, this guy, uh, it occurs in the work of uh, Resk, and he calls it uh, EN. So a lot of what I'm doing is very closely related to Resk's work. Um, anyway, taking the nerves, we get this bigger simplicial set, and somehow this simplicial set is all about category theory, and this simplicial set's all about higher groupoid theory. That's that's the rough theme of the talk. So unfortunately, these guys are really complicated, and that's somehow why the subject becomes so complicated. That's my, my, the way I think of the situation. But um, let me give an example. The one simplex, so what is, so the, 
So it's the nerve of this category with two objects and one morphism between each of them. And so you see that in each dimension there are exactly two simplices, non-degenerate simplices. So this is basically the infinity sphere. It has two hemispheres in each dimension. And so another way of saying it is it's the um, total space of the classifying space of the cyclic group of order two. So that's a, a different. So uh, in Milner's work, it's the infinite join of the two-point set with itself. So it's already pretty complicated, and uh, I have difficulty understanding the higher ones. But let me just use them. Ah, so I'm now going to take the following differential graded algebra. The simplicial cochains on this simplicial complex. And if you know about simplicial cochains, you'll know that you can consider uh, unnormalized or normalized simplicial cochains. I'm going to take the normalized simplicial cochains. So this is some. This is a differential graded algebra. It's not commutative. So if I so I have this differential graded algebra. If I have a pair of differential graded algebras, I can form their tensor product. So in the 1950s, when this was introduced, everybody carefully put a hat over the tensor product to indicate that the product depends on the grading. So you um, alpha 1 tensor A1 times alpha 2 tensor A2 is minus 1 to the degree of A1 times the degree of alpha 2, alpha 1, alpha 2, tensor A1, A2. So this uh, one place that uh, perhaps a lot of you meet this is when you're studying Clifford algebras because then there are two different tensor products on Clifford algebras. There's the, the usual tensor product and there's this graded tensor product. But I'm a bit more modern than that, so I don't bother with the ungraded tensor product. I only think about the graded one. So I have this differential graded algebra. Uh, I've written the product here. The differential is just the differential on the tensor product of complexes. And so it's basically the sum of the two differentials, but with appropriate signs. And I take the Morikato locus of that. So I'm, this is a simplicial set, uh, Xn. And in fact, it's a simplicial scheme. And the theorem is that it satisfies this condition. So let's state that. better replace the simplicial analytic variety so this is this small generalization I'm making of the groupoids so um, let a be a a uh, differential graded Banach algebra with 
a r a i equal to zero if i is less than or equal to minus k. So I want it to be bounded below. There's some dimension below which nothing happens. And this is actually very typical in uh, geometry, that, that you have differential graded algebras of, of this type when you're looking at deformations of perfect complexes, for example. But not, I think, deformations of coherent sheaves. So um, uh, you could, for example, just have a differential graded finite dimensional. It should be fi if it was finite dimensional in each degree, it'll certainly satisfy this condition. So now I take this functor, then x is the nerve of a Lie k groupoid. So that's our theorem. And it's, it's kind of vaguely plausible, but it's not, it's, not, it's not obvious how to prove it. But basically, a, a lot of implicit function theorem does the trick. Um, so to go back to my original example, so examples I'll give two extreme cases. Um, so if, well, let me give three. If A is an algebra, then this is the nerve. So if A is an algebra, then we can take K equal to uh, one because it's concentrated in degree zero. And this is the nerve of GLA. So in particular, the statement I began with that, GL, that this was a manifold uh, is a small part of this whole story. Because obviously, a space such that the map to a point is a submersion is automatically a manifold. So, um, so that's one small piece of the story. And more generally, my story about quasi-equivalences, uh, if a i equals zero for uh, i great, um, greater than zero, then, um, then x zero is just a point, and x one is the quasi-equivalences. And the final example is if A has vanishing product, this is just the eilenberg maclean space. I mean, a differential graded algebra with zero product is a complex. And Eilenberg and MacLean associated to complexes uh, a simplicial abelian group, which in this case will be a simplicial um, vector space. And uh, unfortunately, nobody reads, well, I read, but most people don't read Eilenberg and MacLean's work because everybody calls this functor the dold Kahn functor now, but it's the original functor of Eilenberg and MacLean. The, uh, This is the Allenberg McLean functor. So I have to be a bit careful because A is graded in negative and positive degrees. So I want to truncate it. And also, so I, let's see, I think truncated in degrees less than or equal to one and then we have to shift everything down by one. So it's this eilenberg maclean space. Um, yep, so that, that just to give you some uh, examples of what's going on. Okay? So let's end the speaker. Questions? And what
does the connection with this invertible elements? So the if the if I run this construction with n equals one, mm -hmm. then roughly speaking, I just get the quasi-invertible oh. elements. Yeah, that's it. Reproduce this. This very general construction reproduces all the questions that you know one one has. It's it's a way of packaging the information, and so it's like so concise that I think it must be the right way of saying what's going on. So this work also works in the opposite direction. So if uh, I have something that is a norm of a legal point, so uh, no, uh, no such luck, as far as I know. I don't think um, the so. As we all know, if you have a Lie group, you can re, uh, obtain from it a Lie algebra. And if you have a Lie groupoid, there's also a construction uh, called the, the Lie algebroid of the Lie groupoid. But for Lie k groupoids, the relationship is more complicated because um, high, the higher Lie k algebroids um, have equivalence relations among themselves, as do Lie k groupoids. And so the higher analog of Lie's third theorem is really has to be stated in stack theory, not at the level. What I'm doing here is I'm working with the actual atlases of objects. And we need to correctly say what the objects that these are the atlases of are. So uh, there's more to what we've done, which goes a large way to answering that question, but I thought for the first hour uh, on the subject, it's best not to. So for those of you who've seen, there's a notion called a hypercover or a trivial vibration. And those are the morphisms that should be inverted. And they occur very naturally in this subject. You just, everywhere you have surjectivity in the definition of a hypercover, you replace it by uh, surjective submersion just like in Verdier. More questions? So let's thank the speaker again.